sure you'll all agree with me, is that we have just seen and felt such a huge surge of momentum and excitement. We have taken this discussion to yet another level. Really, the term stratosphere is important and appropriate given the fact that Barbara Morgan is with us, and probably that's still not high enough. But I'm very, very excited about this, and, and let me give you a couple of points to remember, please. Remember that in your packet you have the surveys, and we really want you to fill those out, give us your ideas about what we can do to promote the status of women in the workplace and in positions of leadership, and at the end of the conference, place them on a table outside the Jordan Ballroom. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, number two, as you may know, this time next year, but one week later, we are going to host a major human rights conference, and we already have international human rights rock stars committed. Stay tuned, keep an eye on the Andrus website, and as promised a little bit earlier this morning, we will reconvene this women's conference, this transformative experience next year. We'll do it sometime in the spring, so stay tuned. But anyway, I want to move forward now, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce my partner in crime, the volunteer president of the Andrus Center, Mark Johnson, no stranger to anybody here in Boise and throughout Idaho. Mark has been the driving force of the Andrus Center since its inception back in 1995. He is a wonderful volunteer president for me to work with. Uh, he was in a previous life before he decided to retire, although that word really doesn't apply much to Mark because retirement is not in his vocabulary, but he was uh, the managing partner of Gallatin Public Affairs. Many of you do know him through that incredible blog, uh, Many Things Considered. Uh, check that out at the Johnson Post. It comes out at least weekly, probably it ought to be more often because he has so much to say. He loves baseball, every team I think except for the New York Yankees. And, his, uh, and before that, as you probably recall, he was press secretary and chief of staff for Governor Andrus, and that remains his greatest claim of fame. But I'm very, very happy that he is the president of the Andrus Board of Governors. Mark is going to introduce our wonderful speakers and to promote our further conversation. Mark, please come on up. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, a real honor and pleasure for me to be one of the token males here for the last couple of days and to have a, a minor role in helping David uh, put together such a stellar lineup of presenters. Uh, no diminishment of the stellar uh, quality with the panel that we have assembled for you for the next few minutes. I think probably all of these incredibly accomplished women are well known to you. Dee Sarton, probably the most uh, well-known person in, in uh, the Boise demographic area, uh, longtime anchor person at uh, KTVB, 30-plus uh, years. Dee started when she was six uh, and is, is, is uh, had incredibly accomplished as a, a journalist and a television uh, personality. Next to Dee is Lucy Willits, uh, now uh, Chief of Staff in the uh, Office of the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, uh, a career in politics, having worked uh, for Congressman Mike Simpson and for uh, the State Board of Education. Uh, next to Lucy is um, Nancy Lemus. Nancy is a, a national and certainly a local leader in a industry like all of these accomplished women that is often dominated by males. Uh, Nancy has been very successful with her own business in the commercial real estate uh, arena and has uh, had a variety of responsible national uh, positions in that uh, important industry. Next to uh, Nancy is an old friend of mine, uh, former Chief Justice uh, Linda Koppel Trout, appointed by Governor Andrus to the state's high court. Uh, first woman ever appointed to the state Supreme yes. Court. Thank you. 
And maybe it, maybe it goes without saying that Linda was also the first uh, female Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, serving in that role in two, for two consecutive terms. She also has a, a one other distinction that I'll mention, or many distinctions, but one other that I'll mention at the moment. I think she's one of the very, very few people in Idaho who ser served at every level of our judiciary. She served as a magistrate judge, she served as a district court judge in Lewiston uh, before Governor Andrus uh, put her on the Supreme Court where she did a remarkable job. Last but not least, uh, an incredibly accomplished woman, uh, political leader, uh, leader in the business community, uh, State Senator Cherie Buckner Webb, <laughs> District 19. And if being a member of the Idaho House of Representatives and since uh, 2012 the State Senate were not enough uh, of accomplishment for uh, this outstanding woman, many of you know what an incredibly accomplished singer she is, musician. And uh, maybe we can ask her to break into song here at the end of this afternoon. I have one slide I want to put up because I want to give you just a little bit of political trivia. Fifty-six years ago, the woman on the left-hand side of the screen is Congresswoman Gracie Post, Idaho <coughs> Congresswoman from 19, elected in 1950, served through uh, the late 19, 1952 to 19, through the 1958 uh, session. Next to her is, and President Eisenhower, is Louise Shattuck. I wonder how many of you know that the election in 1956, when Gracie Post, the Democrat, faced off against Louise Shattuck, the Republican, was the first time in the history of the country that two women ran against each other for congressional seat. Wow. It happened right here in Idaho. Gracie Post happened to win that election. Uh, but Louise Shattuck went on to a distinguished career in government, having uh, worked for governors and uh, members of the congressional delegation, an early director of the state, what we now think of as the State Department of Commerce. I tell this story just to make one point. Uh, women have excelled in politics in Idaho, but it hasn't happened very often. It certainly hasn't happened that two women have run for federal office against each other since that time. 56 years ago. So we've only had two women elected to federal office in Idaho. We've only had two women appointed to the state's highest court. Uh, we've done a little better at the legislative level in advancing women in political life and in business and in the business world. But I, I just want to tell that story because I think it underscores the fact that we have had some amazing accomplished women in political and business and judicial life, and in the media for sure, but we obviously have a long, long way to go. So I want to uh, begin by asking each of you, and Judge, I'm going to pick on you first. <laughs> How do you define your success? Now, you didn't tell me you were going to ask me that. <laughs> um, well, I think. I would define my success uh, related certainly to being the first on the Supreme Court and uh, the first female Chief Justice um, because I think that it demonstrated for a lot of people, particularly women, particularly female law students, that it is certainly possible. It's, it's very much possible. And to me, the success is in being able to visit with law students to visit with a group like this and say, it is possible to do this. And I encourage all of you to do whatever it is that you think that would be important to you to accomplish. And I think in, in sending out that message, that's how I would define my success. Were there burdens with being the first? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I got asked a lot uh, because I was the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court what difference was that going to make? Um, why should anybody care that there was now a woman on the court? Um, and, I, and I'm certain that, that there were the, the naysayers who felt that women shouldn't be on the court, and that was part of the question. You're there, why should you be? 
Um, but I think, again, in, in my answer to the comment about defining success, I think the fact that I did do it, I, I think I did it well. Uh, I think I was successful as the chief, and I think that's my answer to them, that uh, it, it isn't that big a burden. All I have to do is demonstrate that it is indeed possible. You needed the chance, though, to demonstrate. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. D, D. Sarton, how do you uh, define your success? Oh, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. <laughs> I, I think for me it's been... Um, being able to be in an industry where I was able to do important work and be part of showing the story, you know, telling the story that we could have a Supreme Court justice that's a female. Now, I have to sort of preface that with this, and I see Claudia out here, and I bet you'll agree with me, Claudia. I got so sick of doing stories about the first female truck driver <laughs> on the highway today, you know, I, and I and they give me those assignments, and it was better than the teddy bear tea party assignments. I mean, it was a graduation from that. But I remember saying to one of the assignment editors one day, "When are we going to be done with this? The first female, you know, this and that, because it sort of it sort of started to feel a little condescending, a little patronizing, and I think that then being able though to see it become normalized and for the stories to have, a, have more meaning, more depth, um, being able to express how a female perspective is important. It's, it's valid and it, it makes a difference in our society. I think we all start, at least I did, I started off thinking I had to be a man-like woman in the media instead of being a woman in the media with a female perspective that is perhaps different perhaps the same but important and at the table. So I guess to try to answer your question, I would say that I've been able to um, go from doing teddy bear tea party stories to the opportunity to tell more important stories and then to share those stories so that now young women everywhere don't think it's even sort of a question that they could do these things. Yeah, there are challenges, but there are so many examples out there, great people who've done it. Now, Dee, uh, having worked in newsrooms a bit in my earlier life, I know that there's kind of an atmosphere, at least there can be sometimes, of it's kind of a locker room environment, you know, mm -hmm. towel slapping and uh, a little bit of uh, political incorrectness, if you will. How, wh how do you operate in that environment? Well, I am proud to tell you that that is not the environment at Channel 7. And, and I think that... Um, well, I'll tell you, I worked in three newsrooms that were exactly like that. A lot of drinking, a lot of sexual harassment. I can tell some pretty juicy stories about some of that. If I had only been thinking and had a good lawyer back in yeah. Washington State, <laughs> you know, things would be different. But when I came to Channel 7, and it certainly evolved over time, but I think um, that there was an expectation that that was not acceptable. It certainly wasn't acceptable to me. And I had good buddies like Carolyn Holly and, and, and great news directors, Rod Grammer, I mean, all the way up, who shared that same philosophy. And Bob Kruger, who became such a, a, a great advocate for women, has become an advocate for women and giving them opportunity in the workplace. So I think I work in a very unusual setting, but I think we had a part in helping make it so that that was not acceptable and would not be tolerated. Nancy, what's your definition of success for yourself? Uh, for myself, I would say my definition is I know I've made a difference as, uh, in all the industries that I have been involved in, which has been four over my career. Um, in many of the industries, I was, I was one of the first women. So through the, my success, it gave, I think it opened the door and allowed uh, people to say, well, I guess the women could make it and allowed them to uh, perhaps interview and, and hire other women as opposed to a woman that failed and said, oh, see, we knew women couldn't make it, which unfortunately I think there's a lot of that as well because they didn't know back in those days how to hire, or maybe even today too, how to hire um, somebody that looks different than, than they do if it's a male that's hiring. Um, my success too is how many times I've been knocked down along the years and picked myself up and dusted myself off. and kept going and uh, as an entrepreneur, I call myself a, a serial entrepreneur, that as an entrepreneur uh, I could create anything out of nothing. So that's one of my success. And of course having two beautiful daughters that are highly uh, successful and, 
and uh, accomplished and talented. That's a success. Wonderful marriage uh, with my husband for 32 years. I'm very happy to say that was successful. So I think just trying to balance my life and always trying to correct myself, get back in balance because I'm always out of balance and it's never ending. And consequently, I think I'm healthy and happy and things are going well. Can I jump in and ask Nancy a question? <laughs> Nancy, you mentioned your daughters, and I was thinking about that today. I have a daughter as well who I'm so proud of, and, and I think that what I've enjoyed seeing in her is that young women today, don't you think they have a little better perspective on the balance they need in their lives Absolutely. than we did coming up because we were struggling so hard to find our place? Mm -hmm. Do you see I that in your daughters? Um, absolutely, I think that they they're they're seeing life through different eyes because you know they don't, they don't have the same issues that we had back in the 1970s. You know, I think one of the things that I was um, sure to do as my children were growing up was always put a mentor in front of them that they could see. Our minister was a was a woman, and our my uh, pediatric dentist was a woman, and and my pediatrician was a woman. And when we first moved to Idaho. Uh, my daughter had pink eye. She was seven years old, and my other daughter was five. She had pink eye, and I took her. I had to find a doctor in the in the phone book, and took her quickly to get the antibiotics to get her back in school that afternoon. And we're walking down the hall, and my five-year-old, who's here today, is now 23, said, "Mommy, I didn't realize boys could be doctors too." <laughs> so I didn't quite realize I was doing that, but obviously I was doing that. So I think there's a lot of opportunities now because these women, young women, has seen women in different positions and realized that it's potentially available to them as well. Uh, Lucy, you're the uh, COO, I guess. That would be uh, one way to describe it, of one of the most important agencies in state government at the center of controversy from time to time. Often. Um, <laughs> tell us about your definition of success for yourself. Well, first of all, I'm going to rat out Mark because I was trying to be a good staffer and I called him like three days ago and I said, what do I need to be prepared for because I'm very type A? And he's like, just be yourself. And I was like, oh, that's so, no, no, I want to know exactly what you're going to ask so that I can prepare. So this is totally off the cuff. Um, you know, I think about this question a lot because there's so many different aspects of, I think, our personalities and our dynamics as women. And uh, I think Success often is just survival. And I saw a woman yesterday who had her baby. <laughs> okay, survival. <laughs> I saw a woman yesterday who had her baby, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have been there. You know, for women, the days are long and the years are short. And when you're, when you're young and you're having babies, and I was very young having babies, um, I just thought, I don't know if I can do this. I mean, this is, I'm working full time and I'm trying to make a difference in public policy and I've got these cute little girls and I want them to succeed. And so it becomes a bit like survival and just trying to make it every day. And so I think when you survive and you are a survivor, you are successful. Now, to look at it from a career wise, and I think we talk about big ideas and we've trotted out a lot of big ideas in this state and some have stuck and some haven't. And you have to learn to ride that public policy wave. But for me, what is an absolute rush, even more than getting bills passed through the legislature and getting able to present, is to go into my child's classroom and see something that is happening that I got through the legislature. That is right. so endearing because it's like I've made a difference. I've made a difference for my child, but I've made a difference for kids. And that's why I get up every day, I get beat up sometimes, sometimes we're successful. But if I can make a difference for my children and your children, then life is a beautiful thing. Senator, uh, David alluded to my interest in baseball. Um, I'll use a baseball analogy. You're a woman. You got the wrong one here. You're, <laughs> you're a woman. You're good. A minority. Yes. A Democrat. Yes. Now that's three strikes yes. in a lot of ways. Yes. I'm but proud you, to say I'm a you, woman but, of a certain age, too, <laughs> if you want to just bring it. You know. But you've been remarkably successful, business-wise, uh, politically. Talk about that. I would say that one of the things, I would say that success has changed for me with each decade, what that means. And, and where I am right this moment, I say that I, I got this amazing inheritance. And that inheritance was all the work that all the women that came before me, 
They did all of this work. Then there was all those women that stood beside me and supported me. If I didn't have my girls, I don't know if I could make it. I'm not talking about my children, because my children are men. But, and I love them. But you know, that sisterhood, that empowerment, that encouragement, that support. And now, I, success for me is the opportunity, for example, to be here today and to pass that legacy on. Mm -hmm. That's success. To have made it a little bit to say, now I can say to I was walking in the door with somebody today and said, what you gonna do? What you been doing? What you, how, how come you're here? That's a powerful opportunity to me. If I can shine a little light that gives you hope, um, encouragement to know that you're doing something for your children, that you know that the young women today think a little bit differently that, than we do. We know that their challenges were not ours, but they have new challenges. And we've heard a lot about them, like objectification and all those kinds of things that we take for granted. I am just blessed beyond belief. And the one last thing that I will tell you, success for me is that I've learned some lessons. You know, and, and I have some seven ups that I call it. I, need, I know I need to show up. I need to stand up for what I believe. I need to speak up. The hardest one is sometimes I need to shut up. Uh, every once in a while I have to stop and, and re-up, make sure that I'm doing what I need to be doing. And the last one is that I need to look up constantly. Success for me. Dee, you alluded to this a moment ago, that there may have been a point in earlier in your uh, distinguished career when you felt as though you had to behave like a man, mm -hmm. like a male in the environment of the television broadcast journalism world. At what point did you feel like, I don't have to do that anymore? It was a slow process. Um, and who was making you feel that way? I think it was just wanting to be accepted yeah. and wanting to have the same opportunities in the environment that I saw my male counterparts having. And for me, it really was, you know, the types of stories that I would get to do. And, um, you know, I started my career as a weather girl and in a market where they wanted me to wear a bikini on the sunny days. Oh, no. And uh, now they hadn't seen me in a bikini, so I'm sure they would have changed their <laughs> mind afterwards. But. You know, so I, I went from so, I mean, it was so, um, I was so categorized as, and I was very young, I was 19 when I started, so I wasn't six, but I was 19, so it was all of these things that I felt I was being treated like a little girl and not taken seriously, and I looked around and I saw, okay, the men swear, they smoke, oh my goodness, smoke was everywhere, and I seriously considered taking up both of those things, <laughs> I'm really glad that I didn't, but I wanted that so badly. So I think I have, as Cherie said, I have so many other women to thank because I started looking at role models. I had a role model in Spokane when I worked up there. Uh, she was an anchor at another station. She kind of took me under her wing and started just mentoring me and, and teaching me what, what I could bring to the table. And then when I, came to, um, when I came to Boise and started working here where I had a Sal Seleski for a news director who who didn't think, you know, I should just be, um, and I, I, I hesitate to say this, but so many females were put on the desk as window dressing. Again, I didn't really fit that, but that was the role. And so I think because I had some of those great men around me who um, expected more of me, it started to raise my expectation for myself. And I would say probably in the 80s, uh, was when, I mean it took, I started in 1975, I would say in the mid 80s, I started to really feel my own and realize that what I had to offer was, um, was me. It wasn't me trying to be somebody else, it was me. Judge uh, Trout, have you, did you have any of that sort of feeling when you came on the court, or at any level on the court, where there's a certain way to behave and that you had to behave that way and conform to a male model of being a judge? I did as a trial judge, um, both as a magistrate and to a lesser extent as a district court judge. Um, I, I had the feeling that, again, that I didn't belong there and that the feeling that I had certain, that others thought that I had certain biases. Uh, I'm a woman, and so in a divorce case, I'm naturally going to side with the woman. Um, those kinds of things that would filter back to me. Um, 
But I, I am very happy to say on the Supreme Court, I never felt that way. And I, I kind of wondered, I mean, I was the first woman they were going to be dealing with. Um, and the court, as you all probably know, travels. So I was going to be spending a lot of time on the road with four other, well, five other men, including our clerk of the court. And I, I never, not one time uh, from the very day I started, did I ever feel that I didn't belong there, that I was different, that I didn't bring a valued perspective. Uh, they were terrific, um, very professional, very polite, very friendly. Uh, and I just felt really, really fortunate to be able to come onto a court with people who I was just another member of the court who had my own, what they perceived, I think, as a valuable perspective. Senator, comment? Um, ask the question one more time. You've, have you been in a circumstance where you felt you had to conform in some way to a male expectation for how you should behave? I will behave? tell you that Dorothy Buckner was my mother and her credo was disturb the peace. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I grew up with that, that kind of perception that often disturbed the peace. And you realize that less than 1% of the Idaho population is African American. So I, just, I worked first in aviation, so there were no women, no black folks, no aviators. So did I feel, I don't know sometimes if I felt the, the greater concern was being female or being African American. But the thing that I'm real conscious of is that mainstream, mainstream dominant culture in the United States has been white male for a long time. So if you look toward leadership, that's usually who you're modeling yourself after a white male. So that method of, of operating was probably top of mind. And I don't know if I thought of it as being male, but uh, finding that way to get to the top, so to speak. So I would say that I did take on what could be considered some male attributes. But they called it bossy when it was me. They called it controlling. They had another B word. Um, some of those things. And, some of the, and, and I, I would say I did have some of those attributes. And then I worked in the timber industry for 10 years, which is very male dominated and, and those kinds of things. So, so I realized that there comes a time that as women, we may operate biculturally. So we are not men, but there are some attributes that we have to take on. We feel like we have to. But I mold them and shape them to be the female Cherie. But I'm aware of it. It's, it's working in this environment. Yeah. And taking on, it's like of the world, but not in the world. I mean, that's for my other friends that understand what I'm talking about. But yes, I did have some attributes could, that could be considered male. Some would call them type A, that we just talked about, and to moderate them in a way that was working well for me. I didn't feel forced, but I did see myself taking on some what may be considered male attributes in the workplace. So Nancy, you've operated for a long time very successfully at the highest levels of an industry that often is dominated by males. How have you navigated through that male-dominated world? Well, fortunately, um, early on in my career, I realized there was an equity of pay being a woman. And I was paid less uh, because I was not married. And the man in the same industry with me was paid more because he was married, which did, and did make sense to me. Since he didn't have children, it's, well, he, he's married. So it, I decided at that point, that if it's to be, it's up to me, that I was going to go into sales. And I've been working basically commission sales since I was 19 years old. So that way I can earn um, based upon my abilities. And that, that helped me quite a bit through, through the different careers that I've had. And uh, when I was with Marcus and Millichap, which was, a, which was the largest real estate investment company in the United States, it was 500 men and two women. Um, so I realized that there was a hostile environment after I was hired, which they didn't want to hire me to begin with. Um, so, but somehow they, I was able to um, get hired, and they would. Uh, I found that the men would break into my desk and steal um, leads, or go through my garbage and steal leads, and obviously trying to get me to leave. Just to get into this company, it it required eight interviews and a two-hour psychological test and a one-hour aptitude test. To just to get in, but yet the men that they had hired previously, they had hired with no tests, maybe two interviews. Um, and at the end of the day, he said, the, my manager, broker manager said, well, if you, if you pass your broker's exam, you can have a job. Well, I, I hadn't even been an agent yet. So 
30 days, it was about two weeks later, I sat for the broker's exam, yet most, all the men had, had agents' exams and had failed m more than once to get, a, to get in. So anyway, I got, into the, I got in there and that's when I realized, you know, why shouldn't I be there? They're make, everybody's making over $100,000 a year, I, I deserve that. So anyway, what happened to, to me during that process was um, because I wasn't really, they didn't want me there, it, made, it propelled me to success, actually, the anger and frustration that I had. So once I started making money, and I was making money with other real estate agents, other real estate brokers, it, they didn't care that I was male or female, white or green, as long as the money was green, they began to do deals with me because they knew that they would make money if they got in the contract with me. So that's, that's probably how I, I overcame it. But I think that um, when I look back on some of the things that happened, um, one, of the, one of my fellow agents called one of my big clients and said I was gonna get fired next week, so why doesn't he go over and work with him? And I was at the shopping center I was selling. So once I realized that, I would go home to my husband and I'd say, well, how would you handle this? And he would say, well, if it were me, I'd pick him up by the shirt collar, throw him against the wall and beat the shit out of him. And I said, I said but I, you know, those who know my husband would understand that. And I said, well, I can't, I'm a woman, I can't do that. You need a step stool. So, you step. so I couldn't do that. So I had to develop my own way of dealing with it. And it was not, it wasn't physical. Um, so anyway, I was able to, to do that. And as I said, once I started making money and they started making money with me, it didn't matter anything. It just, we just, you know, we're colleagues along the way. Can I jump in just for a sure. second? Because I think one of the things that I hear from both of you and I, I experienced is that I was raised to be very polite. And it was kind of a common thing, I think, in the 70s, as we were, I think we're all in roughly the same thing. It's like, you know, you, and you didn't really, especially with authority figures, you, you didn't push or question or that kind of thing too much, especially as a young woman. And I think that was one of the hardest things for me was to figure out how to address it in a way that was professional, but direct, and to then develop those qualities that maybe would be perceived as, as somewhat male qualities in a female way to be able to deal with issues like that. Well, I think, I really think that um, as the years went by, we were able, because our, through our successes, we were able to develop our own, our own strategy to how to do that. Mm -hmm. But in the early years, I think it was, there wasn't a lot of territory that, or a lot of mentors that helped us along the way. Yeah. And I think um, in hindsight, it would have been, now we can, Help, help women now and explain. You don't have to be like a man. You don't have to do the thing. You don't have to swear. You don't have to smoke. You don't have to do the things. And I think there's, a, there's an element of women that, uh, that started doing that back in the 80s especially. Um, but I think in nowadays, you don't, you, we can mentor younger women and say you don't have to, you don't have to act that way. Mm -hmm. I just want to inter interject one thing though. I think it's really important. And I think it's some work that all of us have to do as women still. I think we need to learn how to have conflict. We're so busy nicing folks out. I mean, it's important in the business world. Yeah. In every endeavor I've been in, there has to be conflict. I mean, is there a, is there a term like um, cat fights between men? I don't no. ever hear that term. Two women, educated, having a conversation, maybe in agreement even, but if they sound like they've raised their voices, somebody goes, cat fight, I'd like to show them a cat. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I just think that's one of the things we need to do, constructive conflict. Sometimes the answer is no, right. and to have that engagement. Authentically. I think so often women, Sherry and I were discussing this last night, so often women, um, if they're in conflict on a, let's say on a board level, and somebody disagrees with the other, with a woman disag disagreed with, she takes it personally, you don't like me. Where men would never take it personal, like, you're dumb, you didn't like what I said, you're dumb, it's not my problem. So it's a whole different way that we women have been, I guess, socialized, socialized to think. It's, you know, you're rejecting me, not my idea, and men are like, oh no, you're not rejecting me. I'm rejecting you because you don't like my idea. Yeah. <laughs> Lucy, I'm wondering, you, you started uh, your career in uh, the political arena, as many people do, men and women, at a very young age. Um, very responsible position. I'm wondering, has it gotten better for, for women in the political arena in the time that you've been involved? Well, I'd say yes and no, because the proof is in the pudding. So um, I think women my age have had some tremendous trailblazers, and I never went into politics thinking that I needed to act like a man. I knew that femininity was a strength, and I had seen that from other women. And so I, I think I, I've tried to play on that as I've uh, talked to legislators. 
But if you look at the legislature, mm -hmm. it's virtually all men. You think? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Sherry and I deal with that all the time, and I present in front of Sherry's committees. And, and so I think sometimes there's this notion of like, okay, little girl, you know. And I think it's having that confidence um, about, you know, I know what I'm doing. I know this issue. I can present this to you, and I'm going to sell you on this issue. Um, I think for women my age, it's a different conversation. I think it's a life conversation. And what I mean by this is that I never felt like I had to be like a man. I have often felt pressure as a young married mother and mm -hmm. trying to have a career and, and raising my kids. I wasn't someone who had babies at 30 or 35. I had my first baby at 21. And so here I am, I'm in college, I have a baby. Um, I get a job with Mike Simpson right after that, and that's very rare. I mean, people hadn't seen that, and they hadn't seen a young, a young mother do that. I mean, usually it's like, well, you know, you stay home for a couple years, and, and that just wasn't the choice that I was going to make. And so I have often felt that it's been harder for me in some respects being a young mother. Now, what I've learned over time, and time is wisdom, is to embrace that, and that that's part of who I am and that I do have kids and that they're important to me and to make that a conversation piece when I do business yeah. and that it's part of me and that's okay and yes you can tell me that I'm too young to have kids but I was old enough to have kids you know <laughs> I was married I had kids um, and to make that part of me and to, to decide what I value because in politics there is a drinking culture and you go after work you go down to Bitter Creek and you drink and I had to make a decision very young at 22 and 23 that I was going to go home to my kids because at the end of the day, they were going to love me more than the people in the bars were going to love me. And that is a hard thing to do. You know, that's a really hard thing to do is to make that choice because you feel on one hand like, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm putting my career at risk because I'm not in the group. And then on the other hand going, but look at these kids that are my legacy. And I know that they love me and I can do the best job I can for 10 hours a day, but when the workday is over, I'm going to invest in my legacy. What you need to understand, editorial comment, uh, Lucy, <laughs> is what you need to understand, a lot of those guys at Bitter Creek, they don't really have a life. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, Dee, do you consider yourself a role model? And who have been your role models? Oh, yes. I. Um, I, I do consider myself a role model. I guess because so many young women have come through, they come spend time with us at the station and, and ask us questions. I, I, I do have to say, yeah, Lisa I was, was there. Mm -hmm. um, she could probably answer that. Maybe a bad role model. No, you were awesome. <laughs> but, thank you. Um, <laughs> no, I, you know, it's been, it's not, and that's a fun thing. I mean, it does make you feel a little old, you know, but it's a wonderful thing to think that I was part of such a change in our society. Now, I think it wasn't all good, and I think what Lucy was just expressing, my heart was aching just a little bit, because one of the things I do share with young women that come to me and are looking for a role model is I say to them, you need to consider how you're going to do a career and do a family if family is important to you, because nobody ever said that to me. And when I had my baby, I mean, I was so naive. When I had my little Brianni, I was miserable going back to work. I was miserable because I suddenly had to, I just didn't know how to do it. And I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know how to divide my time. And I didn't know how to make priorities. And I didn't know how to make those decisions and say no to things that were taking me away from my child seven days a week. You know, So um, I tell young women that. And I do hope that, that that can be part of what, as a role model now, I can impart is, um, you know, about doing the job, yes, but also doing life mm -hmm. and how you make that important. Mark, I'd like to speak to that because Dee was an excellent role model for me. So I interned at Channel 7 um, when I was in college and I had a baby mm -hmm. and I would bring little Savannah in her little carrier and I'd edit tapes because I wanted to be Katie Couric. I wanted to be Dee Sardin. I wanted to be on the air and I wanted to do really gut-wrenching interviews. And I would talk to Dee and I would talk to Carolyn and I'd realize, uh, that's not going to fit my life. You know, I'm going to start at a small market, I'm going to work my fingers to the bone, and it's just not going to fit my life. And so you do have to make those choices, and then you have to own those choices. And, you know, it's okay. It's okay, because you'll find other opportunities, and those other opportunities, if you can find the type of opportunity that will fit your life, you will be happier, because 
it's your life. And you're the one who's in control of that. So I just like to give a shout out to Dee because she had that conversation with me and I changed my career track. Judge, did you have a plan for your life? <laughs> I mean, did you consciously sit down and say, here, here are the things that I, how I see my career progressing? No, I did not at all. And uh, I went to college because my dad told me that I was to go to college because that's what you do. And that, there, there was just never any doubt in my mind that I was gonna go to college. Unfortunately, he didn't carry that forward and say, and you have to figure out what you're going to do as a result of going to college. So I used to, I, I look back now and I laugh, um, we used to have goal in life conversations when I became about a junior where he would call me up and say, have you thought yet about what you might want to do? No, no, I haven't really thought about that yet, but I'm really enjoying college, having a great time. Um, so no, I didn't. And I got out of college and went to work uh, at a hospital as a ward clerk because um, someone with a major in English and a minor in French, they were not pounding my door down to hire me. <laughs> But the, the year experience gave me an opportunity to finally sit there and, and think through what I should have thought through about eight years earlier um, and decide, you know what, I, I have relatives that are lawyers and uh, that looks like an interesting, challenging career and I think that's what I'd like to do. And so I applied and happily was accepted to law school. Still did not see being a judge, let alone being on the Supreme Court as part of the overall grand scheme of things. I really thought that I would be a, a lawyer in private practice in Lewiston, Idaho for the rest of my career and was really content to do that and, until I spent a lot of time in court and thought, boy, that judging gig looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> Senator, did you have a life plan? I had so many plans. <laughs> And every time I took another class at Boise State, then my plan changed, <laughs> particularly if I liked the subject matter and the professor. There were many things I wanted to do. And, and one of the things that I'm so um, grateful for is that I've had the opportunity to do lots of keep living, you know, keep living. And I've gotten to do lots of different things. I've been a social worker. I've been a business person. I do um, intercultural competence training. I've been a senator. Who would have thought it? You know, when I when I go somewhere to do work outside of the, outside of Idaho, and I'm leaving on Sunday to do some more in in, in uh, Illinois, and I uh, I say I'm from Boise, Idaho, and people kind of go, oh, they gas. Now, why would that be? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like the day I got elected. Um, I think it was Channel Seven that said, "How does it feel to be black in the legislature?" And it wasn't me. When you. <laughs> So I said it feels real good, real good. So um, yes, I've had so many plans and my plans aren't finished yet. I still have a few more acts. And that's one of the things that I want to encourage young women in particular that say, gosh, I'm having the baby right now. That's all good. Enjoy it, love it. I mean, I was running too because I was trying to do too many things at the same time. And then lo and behold, there's an opportunity. You can do many things, just not all at the same time. So take heart, my sisters. You can do many things, there are many acts. We're getting close to the lunch hour, but I want to try to pose one last question and have each of you comment on it. I'm going to use my own personal uh, observation as being someone who's been in, in politics and in, uh, for the last 20 years almost, uh, owner of a small business and running a small business, hiring people, uh, trying to develop uh, the idea of teamwork. And here's the secret that it took me way, way too long to learn, that women are better teammates and better collaborators uh, in a workplace environment, whether it's politics or the business world, whatever. Uh, I don't know if the media, you find that as, as well, Dee, but women are better partners, better collaborators. There's less ego involved, uh, I less, <laughs> uh oh, I'm getting some disagreement here. I, I think there's always. Um, Am I wrong about that? Here, here's the thing that I, I, I think. 
<laughs> women rock, okay. But I, I just think that when we say women are better this, women are, it puts us all in this one big soup that says we're a monolith, and we are not. We have different styles, we have different ways of working together, and I think that sometimes when, when, when I hear that, my hat just kind of come up because I'm thinking, I'm getting an expectation here that I'm going to be a nice, cooperative, quiet, agreeable, ain't happening. No, I mean, it could happen, it could happen. But I mean, I think that that sets an expectation for me, and that's not a criticism, I hope you understand with all candor. I'm trying to say that I think that's more of putting us in that box that says, be a well-behaved, accommodating, agreeable, accessible. Well, now I've been put in my place just like David Adler <laughs> was put in his place. <laughs> I'm, with all due respect. <laughs> Can I get a witness, please? <laughs> But maybe on the maybe other it's hand, just that I would rather work with a woman. <laughs> yes, but that, that may be so. That may be yeah. so. Yes. But on the other hand, you know, women have had over the years. I think uh, there's a there's a reputation in some workplaces that women do have cat fights and women don't know how to uh, how to c collaborate if there if there's competition between themselves. Do you know what I mean? So I think we've I think we've come a long way in that we. Um, we, when we bring those qualities that, that are, I mean, they are there. I mean, at least I was raised with it, I mentioned it earlier, that, you know, that trying to find common ground, trying Agreed. to get to yes, you know, trying to do that. those things. Yeah, exactly, that, um, that maybe we are a little better at because we've had to negotiate over the years to kind of find our way. D, it's the yes and yes. It's not either or, it's and both, and that yeah. was my point. Okay. That not women yeah. as a whole category are this. I just want to have a little attitude. Oh, I think I we are great collaborators. I think we've made our lives work, uh, being able to get to the positions we are, being good at collaborating. I just don't like to see us put in a single box. Yeah. So I agree with you. Other comments on that? Lucy? So I think in, in my um, industry, um, I've hired a lot of women, and I've hired a lot of men. Yes. And uh, the one thing I look for is not whether they're a woman or a man, but two things. Um, can I work with them? Um, who are they as a person? I mean, I tell people when I interview them, I say, I'm gonna give you the most unconventional interview possible and because I wanna like you. <laughs> and I wanna like who I work with because I'm gonna spend more time with you than I'm gonna spend with my family. And what I found um, is that everyone has their own strengths and their weaknesses and you have to play to people's strengths. But what I would say is that the women that I do hire, and I'm gonna be stereotypical here, is that they get the work done no matter what whether they have to stay late, whatever, they get the work done. And number two, they always remember the details. And, uh, and you need both of those things in your organization, but I think it's really important to recognize, and I, I think it's kind of the elephant in the room often, and I'm not talking Republicans here, because I think I'm probably one of the few ones here, but uh, <laughs> that, um, that I think Idaho is a very patriarchal society, and I think it's a very male-dominated state, and I don't, I think, we all know it, but I think it's hard to say that out loud. Oh, yes. And I think the best thing that we can do is to get women in positions of hiring, because I know the reason that I got a job was because Mike Simpson believed in me, Tom Luna believed in me, the state board believed in me, and they happened to be men, but they gave me a chance to be on the stage with these kind of women. And so the more that we can get women in hiring positions who will look at the, what people are like as people and are they team players, and do they remember the details, and do they get the work done? I think the, the better we'll have um, a workforce that truly gets along and gets work done. Go ahead, please. It, it, it occurs to me that maybe the, the genesis of your comments, though, is that there haven't historically been lots of women in the workplace, and that your comment is really a reflection of there are now lots of women there, and yes, they do get along well and can get a lot of things done. Thanks for cleaning up after me, John. <laughs> That's exactly Just what I Just trying to help. <laughs> um, and I think, I guess the message I, that occurs to me from that is, that's terrific, that's wonderful. Um, it's not the men can't get along and collaborate and get things done, but it is noticeable to you because there are now lots of women out there in various capacities. And yes, we do very well and we get lots done yes, and 
we do accomplish things, and I, I just, I take, I'm very heartened by that. I think that's terrific. Nancy, I'm going to give you the last word. I think there's uh, absolutely more collaboration than ever. When back in the 80s, when I was with this company, I and I was, as I said, it was two women and 500 men. The um, I figured the only way I was going to succeed is find other women like myself to help me get through this. And so I would tell the I told the woman I said, meet me in the, the other lady. Claudia Kelly said, meet me in the bathroom, we got to talk. We'd go to the bathroom, which is where all the deals were made anyway, in the yeah. men's bathroom. Sometimes yeah. I'd hit the door and say, hey, stop making deals in there. But anyway, I said, we can't be, we, we can't be seen together or there's going to be the girls and the boys. I said, you take half this room, I'll take half this room. You find out what they're doing, you play liar's dice or whatever you need to do. I'll come over here and, and find these and we'll get, come back in the bathroom and we'll tell about what's going to happen, what deals are going to come in, how can we bring our clients. So we, that's how we started the process. And I said, one day I said, you know, Claudia, there's other women like us. We need to find each other. So we ran an ad in the San Francisco Chronicle. If you're a woman in commercial real estate, attorney, developer, leasing agent, um, I named them all, meet at the Waterfront Restaurant at 7 o'clock, 110 women showed up. <laughs> this was in 1980, probably around 1985, I would say. 1985, and then, and then fast forward, so that's how, from there, we started Women in Commercial Real Estate in San Francisco. Fast forward a year later, my husband and I are sailing on the East Coast, and I run into a woman who has the same organization in Washington, D.C. She's been going three years, and there's a waiting list to get in. There's 300 women in her, in her organization. Between her organization plus Baltimore and other ones she knew about, my organization other ones that I knew about, which was um, Phoenix and San Diego, and then we wrote a grant for Prudential. We came together every other month for two years and formed what is now called Commercial Real Estate Women. There's 8,000 of us members, 74 major cities, a foundation giving scholarship to women um, in colleges to, to come into the commercial real estate business. And just, I am proud to say just last year, Idaho joined the forces of, of the 74 after all these years. So that's collaboration. And we, we at times we would do deals we call each other up, and in, w in one given deal, we did. I think there were ten of us on this uh, from this organization on the deal. Ten of us between the attorney that represents the title company, the title company, the the, the appraisers. All of us came together. And I think that's the more we do that and understand we're all here to just we have to grab each other's hands and move each other's forward. Grab especially the people along the way that have grabbed me and taken me forward, male or female. We do the same. We have to come back and do the same and pull these women and let these women know where we're at and how we can help them and, and mentor them. And, and I think discrimination, which was so blatant in my day, is still here. It's just gone underground. It's harder to see. So I think we need to help, we need to help the young women to see it when it's coming, whatever it is, whenever it comes. What a wonderful capstone to this conversation. Thank you. Join me in thanking the panelists for a really one more stimulating conversation. Thank you for letting me, as a token male, try to facilitate a, a powerful conversation. Really a great, great fun. Thank you so much for being here. Dee, Lucy, Nancy, Judge, Senator. Executive privilege, ladies and gentlemen, for 60 seconds, if I might. I was not scheduled, and you can see all the heavy lifting people are moving quickly to preempt me. Didn't work. <laughs> now, I, I, I sat here, and I have to say to you, not to our panel, we're, we're very appreciative of the five of you being here with us, but to the women, and particularly the young women that are in this crowd, you see before you five outstanding examples of role models. Uh, I don't care what they would say or how they got there. Uh, and I would say to you, there are others. They're not the only five uh, in this area or in this state or in this world. Uh, but uh, be prepared. There's an old saying of mine, the cream always comes to the top. Uh, and, and it has five examples right here. But uh, it has improved since I first started. But uh, let me say to you that, that be prepared for your opportunity. Uh, pick a role model. Uh, find out uh, 
where you want to go, and uh, you will have that opportunity. And I think Justice Trout would not object if I may use you as an example. Uh, when I was first elected governor, I made up my mind that we were going to have some women in the judiciary. Uh, and I had to overcome a newly created judicial council sometimes to, to, to achieve that. But the justice uh, was a magistrate uh, judge in the Lewiston area. I did not know her until uh, she was put up for that position. But Wynne Blake was a lawyer there. Uh, Don Pinozo was a county commissioner and the way they were selected and they asked me, uh, do you know uh, Linda Coppeltrout? I said, no, but let me take a look at the credentials. They're outstanding. And then she became a, and she was successful. She became a district judge. And then when I had the opportunity as a new governor, uh, I knew, hey, there is the perfect example of the people who went on the court, and there's some other women out here today that qualify in that regard. But the appointment was made, and like she said, it was instantaneous that uh, by her peers, uh, she was recognized as the cream has come to the top. And I can see another one, I, I just see her through there, the appellate court, but I, I promised I'd only, I'd only take a minute. And, and, and you, Proved that point as to what the people have said. You've been an outstanding example. So I would say it's the same with all five of you. I, I know three of you quite well. Two of you I don't know as well. But to the young women out there, that's how you get there. Be prepared for when lightning strikes that, that you, the cream will, it'll come to the top. All you need is a shot. Now, I would say to the Boy, there are not very many male members here, but it's a token male. And, and, and to the women who have the hiring capabilities, make sure that, that the candidates, that, that you young people have a shot. That, that's all you ask for, is having each one of you, all you wanted was an opportunity, and here you are. So now, uh, enough of that, but please take that message back to those people who are in an executive position that, that put people in. Now, uh, the, well, I'll stop there. I was about to say something about, I won't. Back to you, Mark. He was about to make news, D, I think. <laughs> again, thank you all very much. We're uh, going to adjourn uh, down the hall again to the Jordan Ballroom for lunch and the uh, conclusion of this conference with another great presentation. Thank you so much.